Welcome everyone in front of the Suverzi Forum and Suverzi Festival. Actually, these two days were the most important two days for us. So I'm sorry a lot of activists and movements are still not here, but we're a bit early and we need some more discipline in, in the movement as such, I think. Uh, so first, uh, we will be very short. Uh, so we will try to stick to the schedule. Uh, but first, we need to give uh, a short overview of the Suburzi Festival and also an overview of the intention why we are gathering here in Zagreb for these two days. Uh, Igor will speak a bit more on the form of this forum. As you can see, it's a bit different than yesterday because we don't have tables and so on, uh, because the focus is really on discussion and debate. <clears throat> but before that, and before we present our guests on this uh, introductory remark, I want to say something just on the Subversive Forum. So most of you from the Balkans probably know the Subversive uh, Festival started as a Subversive Film Festival five years ago. Uh, this is the fifth year now. Uh, and uh, what is needed uh, to say is that it's not a political, uh, political party or institution. It is and it will stay uh, an independent platform and that's our intention also with the Balkan Forum. Uh, to gather different social movements from all around the world, uh, Europe, uh, South, uh, but also especially from the Balkans, and to speak together about new possible alternatives. Uh, so the main focus on this year's uh, Subversive Forum is uh, there are three levels. Uh, one level uh, is, of course, the European level. So the first two days we had discussions uh, on the European Union and the crisis of the European Union. And together with Transform Network, uh, which is now represented by Walter Bayer here, uh, we, we are participating in the pan-European process of alternatives and also at the same time thinking about new strategies to be done on the European level. Uh, another level is, of course, the global level. Uh, so today with us, there are uh, participants uh, from the World Social Forum, members of, in the, of the International Committee, and I would say also partisans of the movement. Uh, from my left side, uh, no, from, yeah, from my left side, uh, Krishna Murthy uh, from India. He's also part uh, of the World Forum for Alternatives together with Samir Amin on my right side. Uh, Samir Amin, uh, most of you already know, he is the regular and traditional guest and comrade of the Subversive Festival. Uh, this is Igor Stix, uh, <laughs> you also probably know him. Walter Bayer from Transform Network and Vino Draina for the first time in Croatia, also from India, uh, doing a lot of stuff, but also uh, a member of the International Committee of the World Social Forum. Uh, and here we come to the third level. The third level is uh, actually this level which we try to do now. Uh, this is something called the Balkan Forum. Uh, so uh, as far as I know, more than 30 or 40 organizations, movements uh, and individuals are pre present now in Zagreb. Uh, there will be more, I hope, in the next sessions when they wake up. Uh, and uh, our intention is uh, not to focus on differences among us, but to focus on the things which connect us. Uh, and I will give just a short anecdote and then I will pass the mic to, to Igor. So, a few weeks ago, uh, our friends uh, went to a political school in a town near Zagreb called Kumrovets, which is probably known to you. And uh, after the collapse of Yugoslavia, uh, this political school was uh, meant to be destroyed. It's in a very bad shape now. And there were like 2,000 or 5,000, I'm not sure, books there, which were standing there for 20 years. Rain was falling and they were destroyed and so on. And so our friends intended to save the books. One of the books they saved there is this book. Uh, and my friend gave me this book and uh, it's very interesting. Uh, why did he give it to me? He said, uh, you have to show this book to Samir Amin. Uh, the book is published in 1983, uh, which is actually the year when I was born. And inside the book you can find uh, two texts by Samir Amin. Uh, so this brings me also to the intention of this forum. As we can see from this book, uh, obviously 20 years ago, 30 years ago, 40 years ago, this region of the Balkans had good connections with the international progressive movements and intellectuals. These connections were lost, and what we try to do with the Subversive Forum is to rebuild these connections again. 
so that's the reason why our comrades from the World Social Forum are here. And not, not only this, one of the main intention is uh, also during the last 20 years, all connections in the Balkan region were lost. So you had, for example, an example, uh, you had for five, for five or six years ago, you had an example of a factory in Zagreb which was shut down, TEDZ. Uh, the workers occupied the factory and they were saying their influence is Argentina. At the same time in Serbia, you had the case of Yugare Media. They all, the, the factory was also shut down and they were saying their influence uh, is uh, Argentina. Uh, so what we try to do is that these different trade unions, movements and so on look up to each other and connect and I hope we will do it in the next two days. Uh, but I will leave the, 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 the floor to Igor to explain more our idea on the Balkan Forum. Uh, the, the idea came up uh, last year. Uh, we thought that it would be extremely important to, to, to make the working part of the Subversive Forum uh, uh, stronger and bigger within the Subversive Forum. Uh, the evening lectures are important, uh, it, it's important for a wider audience, but it's also important to, to do some work while we are here, so that we do not just gather, as many of us do in many other occasions, talk a bit, discuss, and then go home. We want to, to have some sort of a collective work and especially try to, to build something out of the Subversive Forum. Otherwise, it would be just uh, a regular festival, which is definitely something we don't want to become by any means. Uh, on, the, uh, on the other hand, last year we, we uh, Srečko and I went to Paris to present at the World Social Forum, at the International Committee of World Social Forum, what we do in the Balkans. And we've been encouraged by many of our colleagues and comrades from the World Social Forum to start the process in the Balkans. It's been, the Balkans been painfully absent from the process of the World Social Forum due to, to circumstances that we know, but also due to the specific post-communist predicament in the Balkans and in Eastern Europe, where it was extremely difficult to mobilize people around the question of social justice, in spite of the fact that that enormous transformation of this region turned many, people, uh, turned many people's lives upside down, and that the social justice was present there since the beginning of the so-called transition, but was delegitimized. All actions in these directions were de delegitimized uh, uh, by uh, new uh, anti-communist, uh, pseudo-liberal or some liberal forces, or, and eventually neoliberal forces. The thing, um, on the other hand, we also saw that in the World Social Forum was very oriented towards South and the South-South axis, extremely important in the, in the world today. We want to say to, to our friends there that they should also come back to the Balkans. Samir Amin did it in the 60s and, and came back a couple of years ago here. Uh, Walter is quite familiar with the region, but not all, 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 all other friends with whom we share the same ideas and sometimes the same methods. And we all agree that this has to be done. And therefore, with the help of our friends from Rosa Luxemburg Foundation, uh, we decided to do Balkan Forum. Now, uh, now I'll tell you in three minutes a couple of uh, uh, formal procedures. As you can see, uh, this is not going to be just panel discussions, and this is why we rearrange the space a bit. Uh, we will focus mostly on the debates among delegates, but also with the audience. So the audience should not feel excluded from this circle and should intervene whenever the audience thinks uh, uh, should intervene and help us discuss some of the most pressing issues in the Balkans. And as you see, we have five thematic panels and we'll try to address these issues head on with the very simple questions to, to which the answers are not that simple, which is what, is the, what are the main problems in the Balkans today? Let's try to identify them. And then what is the alternative that we all propose and that we all want to fight for? Uh, as we know, there, there's a lot of different movements fighting the same struggle. As Srećko mentioned, people 200 kilometers away from each other basically do not communicate. Uh, and they, they do communicate or feel more at ease to communicate with, with Argentina or, or some, other, some other places. This has to, to, to stop. Fragmentation is part of, of the so-called uh, transition, is part of a neoliberal transformation of, the, of, of Eastern Europe. Um, if 
big businesses and mafia are united across these borders, I don't see why the left cannot do something to confront this in a, in a united manner or to confront this, uh, uh, this situation uh, uh, with our own ideas that we think that, that we actually have and could be implemented and could be successful. Uh, we'll start and you'll see, this is the introductory session and uh, the next panel will start with the introductory notes by some of the people that we have and we are sure have expertise in the issues. But we'll rush towards the discussion. Discussion and debates are the most important part of this and we'll allow as much time as we can for this. In the third part, we'll have someone who will make conclusions of our, of our discussions and we'll have, again, enough time to debate the conclusions. The, the conclusions will be projected here. If there will be some questions that are, of course, unresolved and we do not agree, we'll definitely keep, keep these issues for the final plenary session uh, tomorrow at the end of this, this big meeting and then we'll discuss these issues again. And out of this Balkan Forum, we'll come out, hopefully, with some conclusions that around which there is a consensus, but consensus is not necessary. There could be dis dissent voices, and we think that this could be the start of a process, not only a one, one event that happens here in Zagreb uh, in May, but basically something that will become a process. This is, and I'll, I'll conclude on this, uh, this is our invitation to, to all progressive Balkan movements to use this uh, forum, this platform, uh, to connect among themselves, to try to, to, to work together, to, to be part of this, this process that will hopefully develop into a sustainable and long-standing uh, platform for our future development of our future strategies, but also our future concrete political actions. And now I'll pass the, the, the microphone to um, Samir Amin uh, to tell us why it is important to reconnect the Balkans with the global movements. Uh, thank you, Igor. Um, welcome to the friends of the Balkan uh, countries. Uh, I'm uh, personally, and we are all very happy uh, to establish some connection with you I must confess that I personally and we, the World Forum for Alternatives, had uh, almost no connection. It was cut. We have connections with other regions in the world, including in Europe, but uh, unfortunately, Eastern Europe and Southeast Europe, the Balkan, uh, very tiny. Now, uh, I think it's, uh, it's a, a very important thing that uh, the movements in struggle, and I'm... I'm stressing in struggle, of the, this region come together to discuss their issues and their possible common strategic targets uh, among themselves and with others. And with others meaning not only other Europeans, but others in the, in the world. Uh, movements in struggle, uh, I mean by movements in struggle, movements which are struggling for associating the democratization of the societies with social progress. Now, I'm saying democratization of the societies, which is a process, and an endless process, which is far more than just the recipe, the blueprint of so-called democracy, the farce or caricature democracy of pluriparty electoral representative democracy. Um, that is one. Uh, uh, associating this, these processes of uh, democratization of societies with social progress. I'm not saying socialism. I'm saying social progress that is of patterns of management of the economy, the society, and the political sphere, which uh, as, uh, which, which lead to the vast majorities, who are the working people, uh, benefiting from it and not uh, exclusively a, 
and more and more a minority through growing uh, pauperization of the majority and inequality to the benefit of minority. Uh, this is my definition of movements which are in relevant struggles. If they don't struggle for uh, democratization of the societies associated with social progress, well, they are simply, they may, might be social movements, but they are reactionary social movements. And in history, you don't have exclusively progressive social movements. You have also reactionary social movements. And when I'm saying social movements, I include, of course, also political activities, political parties, and all sorts of, I don't put any boundary of categories. Now, that is uh, point one. Point two is, in which frame are you, those movements should which should discuss and come together and uh, try to, uh, to, uh, to um, um, define uh, common targets, uh, how, uh, in, in what frame are you operating? Well, you happen to be uh, members of the European Union for all of you or those who are not yet are candidate to be. Uh, none of you is a member of the Eurozone, uh, but another Balkanic country which must be associated with you, which is Greece, is or still is a member of that. Now, um, therefore, uh, how do you see the issues of how to struggle for democratization associated with social progress in that frame. Now, since, uh, I, uh, since the time is, uh, is very limited, I'll, I'll give my personal uh, opinion, uh, which is controversial, uh, and uh, I'm absolutely prepared to hear uh, the opposite of it, which is that the frame is totally, totally in conflict with any target of democratization of the societies associated to social progress. Uh, the European Union and a fortiori the Euro uh, have been established, constructed with a, in a, with a view to make impossible associating, impossible having the democratization of the society. It is an anti-democratic uh, pattern, frame, and a fortiori not allowing it to be associated with social progress, but favoring the exclusive domination of monopoly capital that is associating it with a process, endless process of growing inequality and growing pauperization. It is a, 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 a frame which is based on destroying the sovereignty of nations, of states, to the benefit of exclusive domination of capital, systematically. Now, we, we, one can discuss whether it could be different, whether the struggle for it to be changed is possible or not. That are real issues, in my opinion, which should be uh, very openly discussed with uh, listening to the different analysis and conclusions from those analyses. Uh, that, is, um, that is the frame. Uh, which means, you know, uh, Europe, in a very easy and wrong rhetoric, has been presented for, I would say, propaganda uh, reasons, come uh, uh, as, as uh, uh, another United States, another big capitalist, of course, but big, important uh, economic power, and uh, offering to the various partners in that European Union the possibility of catching up, of becoming similar to those who are a little more advanced in a, in a capitalist stream in the region. I think this is, has nothing to do with really existing Europe. I'm not going to go, time does not allow, in the uh, very uh, <clears throat> complex question of the so-called European identity, if it does exist or not, et cetera, et cetera. But the frame does not allow, uh, does not allow for, 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 for that. And uh, therefore, the, um, uh, it has, Europe is in fact, there 
should not be compared to the United States. It should be compared to the American continent. Of course, there are huge differences. The American continent, north and south, is gigantic, and particularly from the point of view of natural resources, is something very different from uh, Europe, even in, if, especially if you exclude Russia from Europe, Russia, and it's Siberian Russia, uh, from that point of view. But it should be, which means that if you look at the American continent and the Monroe Doctrine, you have one center, the United States, and a periphery, Latin America. Well, I'm saying that in Europe you have the same. You have a, a core. Uh, I'm, I'm not going to put boundaries about the core because we, it could be endless. There are center, peripheries, semi-peripheries, as you want, but the core is visibly the most advanced. Uh, let's say Britain, Germany, France, uh, to, say, to speak of the nucleus, uh, plus some countries around, uh, and the periphery, and you belong to the periphery. Now, this project has been built in order for the core to benefit from the periphery, from the benefit in a double way. One, by super-exploiting the natural resources and the labor force of its internal periphery. There is a Monroe Doctrine in Europe, which might be a German doctrine, but a Monroe Doctrine of the core vis-a-vis -vis its periphery. You are the Latin America of Europe, within Europe. Hmm? Uh, you, in my opinion, you are that. And you are, that is, you are not going to benefit from the uh, uh, monopoly imperialist rent, but to, be, to contribute to that monopoly imperialist rent by being overexploited in a variety of, of forms. Uh, 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 now, that, that, that is what is the relation of the Balkan, including Greece, including Greece. Now, uh, it seems that, it seems that I don't know what it means, the general opinion, because of the way with the brutal uh, uh, breakdown of the previous system, so-called social debate is not around that matter, um, <clears throat> that um, there, there was, perhaps there is still, I don't know, a terrific illusion that, well, uh, Europe is moving into Europe, is going to offer us the possibility of becoming, of enjoying democracy and becoming gradually uh, uh, homogenized on, uh, to, uh, for, uh, as the centers of Europe are. Uh, which, uh, uh, that was accepted because you had to be punished for having been different, uh, whether socialist or not for having been different. You have to be punished. And, uh, uh, but this punishment is for a transition period and then we'll, ha we'll be gloriously partners in uh, what is the collective imperialism in which the European core, not Europe, the European core is a partner with the United States and Japan and therefore benefit from it. Uh, I don't know if this illusion is uh, still there. I hope that it is reducing and that the people can see through their own experience that the process is a process of continuous uh, inequality, growing inequality, growing pauperization for the majorities and uh, therefore is a blind alley. Uh, that is the issue as I see it. I will stop at that point. Uh, 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 which is um, the place of, uh, of, uh, of the Balkan states uh, or, or societies within, not Europe, within the global system through Europe. And that is very different, uh, not isolating a pseudo-existing Europe uh, from the global system, but as parts of a complex construction in which uh, 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 unbalanced and purposely unequal and growing unequal Europe as a building block of the, uh, of the uh, imperialist uh, triad control of the uh, globalized system. Thank you. Thank you, Samir.
uh, now um, I'll ask our friends from India. Uh, in some European university, there's a rule who comes from the furthest point, has the right to talk first. So I'm not sure is whose home is closer to Croatia, Vinod's or Krishnamurti's? Maybe, maybe Krishnamurti. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Northern India, Northern India. North India. <laughs> <laughs> so, good morning, friends. Uh, it is a pleasure to be here with uh, you, and thanks to Sheshko and Igor and uh, Misho, who is not here, and many friends here. Uh, I'll just uh, come to the WSF process and explain why we today are going to discuss of the possibility of building up a, a Balkan Forum. Uh, it was in the 90s, and uh, we know that there was the fall of the Berlin Wall. And uh, there was Thatcher, Reagan, shouting that now socialism is dead. The only alternative is capitalism, and capitalism has come to stay. So just now we are witnessing what is happening in, in Greece and in Europe, where is the cry whether, the, whether the capitalism is made to be forever. But when the WSA process started, it was in that context. And many of you know that the, after the fall of the Berlin Wall, there was a total brainwash all over the world of anti-communism, anti-socialism, and whatever could be a collective society. And it was at the time, most of our countries in Africa, Asia, and Latin America, we were undergoing what's called the structural adjustment to please the IF, uh, IFM, FMI, and the uh, World Bank, of course, there was the WTO. And we were told that we are going now to have, uh, uh, with the neoliberal policies, we are going to attain the same level of life as in Europe. So most of our ruling classes were lured to buy these uh, things, and uh, they just imposed on our countries structural adjustments, adjustment which, of course, made people rich, because you do talk about India reaching 10% of uh, uh, GDP. But what is that India? What is that Africa? It's maybe in some cities, in some, some millionaires may be there. But the rest of India, 80% of India, or if not much more, we still live in the same era, plunder after colonialism, now neoliberalism. We call it chain name. But things are continuing. And it was in that context that uh, the urge of a change came up in many countries. There was no international. We were not having any, no more Russia, no more China. Socialism was a chatter. And people wanted to gather, to think, to search for a new alternative. So WSF came on that way. The World Social Forum is not really just an imaginary thing. It was almost imposed by the situation we were living in, that there's a need of coming together. South, North, East, West, Asia, Africa, Latin America mostly. We needed to come together and see, say no to capitalism first, that there can be an alternative, so say yes for alternatives, and how to build up the alternatives. So WSF had no protection. It gave a space for many of us from different streams of thought, ideology. Some were NGOs, some were in India, for instance. We had all shades of political uh, ideology we could think about, from Ambedkarites, Jay Prakash, Gandhians, Marxist, Marxist, Maoist, Trotskites, all shades, women movement, ecology, Dalit organizations, peasant organizations, all came together. And this thing which started in Porto Alegre, in a, maybe not, they did not think 
it could become a, uh, taken over by the people. In Mumbai, the participation of people from all streams show that pe people are ready for a change. But we need to come forward with, a, with an alternative. What could be the alternative? So debates are there. So we will be debating more afterwards. I will uh, intervene afterwards. So WSF is only a platform, an open space. It brings together. It brings together many people. But the alternative, the ultimate alternative of constructing or building up an answer, whether in Greece or India or in Latin America, can come forward only with the movements. Because I belong to the trade union, I work among coal miners. And I feel that unless political parties and mass movement come together and now face these challenges and come with an alternative or the alternatives, it has no, uh, the, f the world has no future. Cap we are seeing capitalism is just already shattered. What will happen in Greece tomorrow may happen to India, may happen to all over Europe. So let us think about it. Thank you a lot. Now I think we will pass the word to Winod Reina and then conclude with Walter okay. Bayer. Or? Um, thank you very much. First of all, uh, I'm so grateful for the opportunity to be in this region for the first time. Um, a region which has been in our imagination something very close uh, for, for many years since um, we became political activists. Um, we are here discussing a very specific thing about um, the formation of a Balkan Forum, and possibility the Balkan Forum transforming into a Balkan Social Forum and getting linked to the World Social Forum. I believe that's the kind of um, main agenda we're discussing today. Um, well, the crafting of this world after the Second World War could broadly be called three imperialisms. The economic imperialism, the imperialism of war, the imperialism of war and militarism, and increasingly now the ecological imperialism. So we are confronted in the post-Second World War situation of a growing uh, rise of these three imperialisms. Um, it was bipolar till we had socialist states in Eastern Europe and Soviet Union, and therefore there was some kind of balance to these imperialisms. But with the dismantling of the Eastern European socialist states and Soviet Union, what we are seeing is a unipolar imperialist order, um, which is exploiting and suffocating the people of the world all over. And in this suffocation, I don't think there is any difference between the people of Asia, Africa, Balkans, Europe, uh, Latin America, and even of uh, North America, of the people. The responses, particularly with the dismantling of the socialist states, um, got fragmented. Uh, it got fragmented into what we are calling the political left political parties, um, trade unions, but many new formations coming up on the basis of ecology or identity, women's movements, uh, movements fighting against racial discrimination, uh, religious movements, um, religious movements which uh, some of them ecumenical, some of them what we call fundamentalist extremes. But more important to me, the fragmentation of the left itself. At one point of time, we had 13 communist parties in India, 13. There's been a bit of unification and we have five now. And Murthy and I belong to one of those the Communist Party in India, which is called Maoist now, but was called Marxist-Leninist at one point of time. And therefore, we have been characterized by this very deep fragmentation of the resistances to these imperialisms. And therefore, I think the world was crying out for a platform which could try some form of, not unity, that's a very strong word, but coming together of this fragmented response. And therefore, it is not surprising that in 2001, it could have taken place anywhere, I think, because finally what, what, what takes place can be very spontaneous. 
And therefore, what took place was in Brazil, uh, and more importantly, originating from a workers' party, the PT of Brazil, which gave this formation of the World Social Forum. And I don't think the people who started the World Social Forum at that point of time knew what kind of animal they were creating. And I don't think anyone understands this animal even today. Most of the people involved with the World Social Forum take a lot of effort in denouncing the World Social Forum. But at the end of it, they're back at the forum when it takes place. Because it's, it's a very, very peculiar formation with which we have been very unfamiliar. But it's a new politics. It's not only a new, org it's not an organization to begin with. So I, I have to be very careful with the words. It's not an organization. So it's very unfamiliar from the traditional left formations. And it's very bewildering from the traditional left formations. For example, it doesn't have a central committee. It doesn't have a Politburo. It doesn't even have a general secretary. No one can represent it. Uh, no, none of us sitting here can represent it. Because it is just a space. It's not an organization. Now that's something that many traditional left thinking people find very difficult to understand. It doesn't have a slogan. Well, there is a slogan, but it's not a slogan of a anti-capitalist type or pro-socialism type. The slogan is, another world is possible. So it's a slogan inviting people to craft a different world from the present world. And to me, that means a world where these three imperialisms, the economic, the war, militarism, and ecological, do not operate. So that's an overarching slogan. So it's a platform of trying to bring together this fragmentation. Now, one of the most exasperating things about World Social Forum is who are you trying to bring together? You're trying to bring together those um, concepts, those politics, which are fighting each other at some other point of time. You are trying to bring in people who talk of radical feminism, but we, at the same time will say, oh, no, no socialism. The world must have radical feminism. And you're making them share a space with trade unions whose slogan is end of capitalism. So that's what many people find very interesting and frustrating together. Now, what does it mean to do a, if you want to go from a Balkan forum to a Balkan social forum, and the social would be then you're integrating with something which has uh, been there for the last 10 or 11 years. It would impose these kind of restrictions, and they could be, they could be things that people don't agree with, and therefore they shouldn't have a Balkan social forum and be content with the Balkan forum. The kind of restrictions would be that if you're going to do it next year or two years later, some people have to come together, very mad people. Uh, they have to be very mad to be doing this. And say, we will organize a space for people, but we're not telling you what will be the conferences, what will be the themes and topics. You come, the space is there, you do your conferences and events. And you can do whatever you feel like, provided the conferences or events are against neoliberalism. So the space is not available for groups who promote neoliberalism. So there's an exclusion principle. Groups who promote neoliberalism, who promote violence, the space is not available to them. But all those other groups who are against any of these three imperialisms, economic, war, and um, ecological, you can come. You can do your feminist, you can do your environmental, you can do trade unionism, you can do human rights, you can do uh, racial discrimination, you can, you can be together. But at the end of it, there will be no attempt to make a common statement. There will be no common declaration. Because the World Social Forum space does not give a declaration, something people are mad against. They, they feel that if you come together, you must have a declaration. But the Social Forum says, no, we will not have a common declaration. However, 
groups that come to the forum are free to, amongst themselves, have as many declarations as they feel like. But it will be name, in the name of the movements who come to the forum. It will not be in the name of the, of the forum itself, but of participating groups. Um, so people find that very funny because we're not used to that kind of politics. So it's a space for anti-neoliberalism, anti-capitalism, against war. So you can, you, can, you can have your unities there. You can form your networks and unities and continue working uh, for the next years. So it is a place to connect. Now, that's the way it has been crafted. That's the way it's run. That's the way it is uh, criticized and denounced. And that's the way people participate. Now, people participate in the Mumbai Forum after Brazil. The Brazilians actually in 2002, after the second forum, got hold of us Indians and said, we want this forum to travel in the world and we want it to go to Asia and to India. And we said, come on, don't be mad. We don't want to do it. So why do you do, not, not want to do it? We said, we can't do it because we're so divided. We can't get together to do a forum when we are so divided as trade unions, as parties, as, as uh, NGOs, as uh, feminist movements, ecological movements. We can't sit together and do it. And they kept on telling us, no, try and try and try. And then some crazy guys like Murthy, me, and many of us, 207 of us, formed the India Committee. And it actually got formed. I'm still surprised how it got formed. And it got formed. And in the Mumbai Forum in January 2004, 130,000 people participated. 130,000 people participated. Uh, in, in, a, in a show of people's strength that was breathtaking, to, even to us. And to, to this date, we don't understand how did people come together who don't otherwise sit together with each other. They keep on writing statements against each other. And we had a very peculiar thing, because some friends from us, from the, from the, particularly from the Communist Party, Maoists, who disagreed with us on the social forum, and they said, we're not going to participate. At the end of it, they said, we will not participate. So they said, we're going to have a forum against the forum. So during the days of the forum, they set up a forum called the Mumbai Resistance. And the Mumbai Resistance was a forum against this forum. But at the end of the day, they would come to this site, and we would sit, and we would chat, and they would sleep there, and they would take all the water we had stored there, and we were sharing everything. And everyone said, this is great. If you can accommodate a difference as, as a parallel forum, well, that's fine. We need to do that. So there was no fight at, at the end of it, but there was some kind of a, I wouldn't say political unity, but a new form of politics emerging in, from, from the Mumbai resistance. Now, what will it lead to? Will it lead to unities? Will it lead to uh, combined uh, uh, platforms where we work together, where the uh, feminists and uh, ecologists and the anti-capitalists uh, and the trade unions will form common fronts and so on? That's a hope. But that hope is not necessarily going to be realized, realized tomorrow. But what I think is uh, invigorating about a uh, World Social Forum process is that it does provide incentive for us to be together in the same space and then decide whether we want to be together or we want to go back and work separately. At least provides an opening for doing that. And in, in, in a world today where I think it's not the lack of ideas of anti-capitalism that's the problem. It is the problem of us uniting with those ideas. And in forming that kind of unity, probably the social forum process provides us a tiny platform to test out our uh, ways of political formation as a response to these three imperialisms. Because if we cannot do that, then I think the people of the world are doomed. So I think in precisely from that whether it's Greece or whether it's Spain or whether it's other parts of Europe or whether it's parts of Asia, in the response that the people uh, require, we need to confront these imperialisms by some form of political unities. Thank you. Thanks a lot. Now, Walter. Thank you. First of all, <clears throat> I really want to congratulate to you for having undertaken this effort of creating the Balkan Forum. 
And secondly, I, I have to say this, I have to confess this, listening uh, to uh, Vinod's introduction, I uh, remembered that for uh, a rather long period of my political life, I really was in love with the World Social Forum because of all these things which you have explained. And I want to start by saying that um, during my whole political life, I always was amazed uh, that um, an innovative idea was brought up, it pops up, it works out fine, and after 10 years, it turns out that it's not the ultimate solution of all mysteries of the world. Then, uh, to a certain degree, the movement uh, retreats, and people tend then um, to unlearn what they have achieved and to forget what they have achieved. And I think this time we should do it better, namely uh, to understand what the World Social Forum process as such really carried um, regarding its innovative character. Uh, for example, diversity. Uh, it's a huge thing when uh, in 2010 we went to Porto Alegre, there were 20, 30,000 people, hundreds of events, debates, discussions. And uh, having seen this diversity, um, for me as a European, uh, it was not only to overcome a certain sectarianism, uh, which comes from this avant-gardist tradition, which uh, a large part of the traditional left has, uh, but also to understand that the diversity of the movement also reflects the diversity of the world. You cannot have the idea that one ideology is able to draw all the necessary conclusions of the uh, crisis in which the world today is. For example, uh, feminism. Uh, I always uh, belong to a, a Marxist movement, but I have to admit uh, that feminism draw the attention uh, to an aspect of suppression and exploitation which traditionally was not covered by Marxist analysis. And I would go further. Uh, patriarchal exploitation is one of the blind spots even of Marx's famous work, The Capital. It does not appear there as a, a social relation. And that's why you have to accept that people from different experiences uh, develop different uh, theoretical concepts and you have to provide the possibility that these different concepts can be expressed and can be compared and that the best in the cases then they uh, lead to a common political, let's say, target in order to change the world. But this also then has to do with the concept which uh, in a Gramscian way is called hegemony. Traditionally, the left, in particular in Europe, thought that hegemony is something which belongs to a certain class. And as the class is organized by a certain party, hegemony belongs to a certain party. And who then does not accept this party is outside of this hegemonic um, system and somehow has to be regarded as a sort of an enemy. And this made so much damage to the left worldwide in, and in Europe. And what we have learned during the World Social Forum was that we have to understand that hegemony has to be developed as a common, meaning has to be uh, something which embraces diversity and at the same time gives space that these diversities are interpreted in terms of their convergences. This has to do with respect, this has to do with the capacity to listen to each other, and this has also to do with the readiness to change a position which you have thought was the right one for couples of years, and maybe even uh, your whole political life. So this this is one of the, 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 the important achievements of the World Social Forum process. And then uh, this, uh, I would also um, add to the achievements. The slogan, another world is possible, 
uh, in my opinion, is the most revolutionary slogan uh, after the famous uh, word of Marx that uh, the proletarians of the world have to unite. Why is it so? Uh, people in, in, in Europe and, and, and also in my country used to say, well, I mean, what does it mean another word is possible? Another word is necessary? Yeah. But please, what kind of revolutionary orientation is this to declare something as a necessity which is not possible? <laughs> and to convince people that another world is possible, this is really what revolutionary movement is about to make it possible and to make people believe, to convince that it is possible. And having said so, uh, I, I want to say that uh, when the movement then uh, reached its climax, and this was undoubtedly in February 2003, when we were able to mobilize 25 million people all over the world. Imagine how proud we all have been as we were in Porto Alegre in, the, in this assembly which called for a worldwide movement against the war and in Firenze where we called for European demonstrations against the war and then 25 million showed up in the streets. Can you imagine what this means? Maybe this was the biggest peace movement in uh, the history of the labor movement but we didn't prevent the war. And uh, this, uh, I would not blame the, the, the World Social Forum for it. Uh, it displayed that even if you are able to create such a huge hegemonic space, if the power relation does not allow the change, you end up with a defeat. And this uh, draws the attention to that what I would call the, the, the limit of the movements, uh, namely to understand that hegemony is a necessary but not a sufficient condition to change the world. If you want to change the world, you have to have uh, uh, social alliances, you have to have a culture of change, but I'm afraid to say so, you have to have the political power to do it. And to have, to have the political power to break the resistances against the change. Because these resistances do not come from only uh, cultural reservations against change. These resistances have to do with interests, with powerful material interests. And um, in, in that sense, I would say, uh, that we here in uh, Europe have now to uh, cope with the challenge of that what has changed in the course of the, uh, of the crisis. Uh, when talking about the crisis, I always tend to, disting to distinguish between uh, at least three levels. One level is, and this is in my opinion, the most important aspect of the crisis that Europe, the US and Japan have to accommodate with a completely changed world. It is impossible to uh, imagine that the world indefinitely will accept that, 20, that societies which represent 20% of the whole population of the world colonialize 80% of the populations of the world. And uh, since the world is changing, this creates crises and upheavals in the uh, respective societies. Secondly, and this is also evident, capitalist production has uh, reached objective limits of, uh, uh, of the productivist uh, civilizational model. It has to change, and it has, if it does not change, uh, in an active and proactive way, then it has to accommodate with the, uh, with the realities of the world, which does not allow to continue uh, as the world developed. And thirdly, and this has been uh, widely and largely discussed uh, uh, yesterday and the, the day before yesterday, there are, of course, structural uh, aspects of the crisis which uh, lie in the overaccumulation of capital and the social inequality in Europe and so on and so forth, and I, I don't want to go into the, into the details. But what I want to stress at this occasion is uh, to understand the actual European situation, you have to take in consideration that uh, the austerity measures are 
not so much meant to respond to the crisis, it's vice versa. The crisis is now used as an instrument to impose these austerity measures uh, upon the populations. Meaning, uh, you see all over in Europe now a fierce class political offensive against the welfare state, against uh, the uh, public services, aiming at decreasing and lowering the living standards of million and million people. Or otherwise said, what is at stake at Europe is the degradation of human labor in relation to capital. And this we have to oppose. And uh, in this attempt to oppose now, uh, we find different readings of this situation. One of the readings, for example, is, and uh, Samir mentioned this, uh, well, there is a European identity, and in order to keep and maintain this European identity, we have to sacrifice our living standards. If you ask me what a European identity was, I could not give you an answer. That what the ruling circles say, yes, it has to do with the Carta of Human Rights, it has to do with humanism, it has to do with Greek democracy, this is euphemism and is a lie. It has to do with fascism, it has to do with Stalinism, it has to do with colonialism. And that means that European identity is not something which you can take for granted. European identity may be a common understanding of the European populations, how they will shape their future and how they will relate to the rest of the world, but it is not something which exists. And what's then the alternative to this famous um, uh, European identity? National identity? Come on. I mean, uh, you here in the space, uh, in, in this territory, you know very well to which ends the exaggeration of national identity may lead. And this goes for whole, for whole Europe. And that's why I say, uh, when talking about the task of the left, what we have to develop is not a national identity, it's not a European identity. What we need to have to develop is a class identity, meaning to explain to people there is an upper class, there is an elite which exploits the society, and there is an underclass which is exploited, which is subordinated, and which have to resist. And in order to resist, it has to develop its own identity, namely as a class, as the class of the oppressed. And uh, finally, I want to say, uh, you may now be part of the European Union or not. And all of you uh, who are concerned with this question should really thoroughly think about it. What is the best way to decide and what do you recommend to your populations? But being once in the European Union, I would recommend very strongly that you emphasize the fact that then you will be united with the working classes of the other European countries and that you have to develop structures of solidarity. And one of these structures might be the social forum process. There may be other structures. What counts in the moment in Europe is resistance, is the struggle for a political alternative, and is the international solidarity of all these populations which are now threatened by this destructive policy of the political elites. Thanks for the attention. Thank you, Thank you all four of you. Um, we'll take from the slogan, which seems simplistic, but it's, ex as uh, Walter said, revolutionary, so we could think along the lines of another Balkan is possible. Uh, the the uh, entirely different version of, of the Balkan has been imposed with devastating consequences on us. And it is the hegemonic force, meaning the Balkans as fragmented, as eternally divided, as eternally in conflict with, with one another. This is a huge responsibility, actually, that we have uh, here as individuals, as intellectuals, as activists, as whatever you want to call us, to overturn this. Or maybe this, this event uh, might uh, show a different direction that, that another Balkan is possible. Or we might show that, that 
naturally we conform to the stereotype that another Balkan is not possible, that the, the even progressive forces are prone to sectarianism and to, to, to fragmentation and to little interest, and very often, which often gets into the leftist conscience, consciousness, uh, prone to, 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 to nationalism and prone to, prone to provincialism. Uh, this is, a, I'm again underlying this word, responsibility. It was not easy to bring you all here. Uh, this was our first objective. I think we succeeded. The second objective will be to, to have a productive work and to produce something, at least a common ground and a platform. And the third objective will be to launch the process that will not die tomorrow evening, but will actually develop so that the next year when we meet, and hopefully we will meet within the Balkan Forum, we'll have even more organizations with us and even more concrete proposals. But I would like to thank once again to our friend, friends who came from very different and close countries and, and countries far away and brought us this experience. It's very inspirational. Thank you very much.